Well, I, I just will start and say I'm so delighted to be here and to be asked by Antis to help out uh, in the meager role of moderator um, discussing this absolutely wonderful novel um, by my, um, my, to be honest, my good friend, as well as, as all of our other things in our introductions uh, that were mentioned. Jeremy is also a very good friend of mine. And um, I will admit up front, maybe it's dangerous to admit something like this before we get into a long conversation with an author that is a little bit dicey uh, to um, volunteer to interview or do anything with one of one's friends. And uh, my typical, I guess, my usual rule of thumb is like, don't do that. But I would have been so excited for this book to be released. Um, and uh, when I uh, read read it, uh, just was had no reservations to agree to, to um, moderate this discussion with Jeremy. And I'm really looking forward to discussing it. But I just wanted to mention that um, as you know, to everyone tonight too, just that my own reservations that typically not doing that just went out the window because I was so excited and delighted um, to uh, talk about this book um, with Jeremy and uh, and with all of you tonight. Um, so I and I will do my best not to just go on and on and on about this book. It's going to be hard for me. Um, I had a really <laughs> wonderful immersive reading experience with it. Um, Jeremy, I was wondering if you would be interested in maybe just uh, for folks who have not had a chance to read the book so far, would you have sort of a small kind of a, um, like, would you like to describe it a bit to folks or just tell them maybe a little bit of what they might expect coming to your novel before I kind of dive into some questions? Sure. Um, so The Hand of the Sun King is a fantasy novel um, that's largely inspired by a few things, um, which I, we might talk about more later. But uh, as was mentioned in the introductions, I spent some time living in Beijing and Taiwan. Um, and so the setting is inspired by that, although not uh, directly analogous to any particular period in history or any particular geography. Um, uh, Guy Gabriel Kay, who's an author I really respect, talks about writing fantasy inspired by history uh, as, as taking a quarter turn away from reality and into fantasy. And that's kind of the approach that I tried to take. So it's definitely inspired by some things I studied in college and some experiences I've had out in the world, but it's very much a secondary world fantasy novel, meaning it takes place in a different world from ours. Um, it's a, a coming of age story about um, a young man named Wen Alder, who uh, has a very interesting family history. Um, his father's side has historically served an empire which has conquered the country where they currently live, where Alder grows up. Um, but his mother's side has been very involved with a rebellion that's fighting against the empire. And so the story is, is kind of a coming of age story about uh, figuring out what path you want to take through the world and what your values are as an individual when you're presented with many different options of, of who you could be or what you want to do. Um, it's also got a lot of magic in it. Uh, my older brother read it and he said, this is kind of like Avatar The Last Airbender, but for adults. And I think that that's an <laughs> accurate way of describing the magic system. If you have seen Avatar The Last Airbender, each culture kind of has a different magic. And then um, certain characters can use magic across cultures and things like that. And in this, it's sort of similar, although it's not that each culture has a, an ingrained born in magic. It's that different cultures have different ways of using the magic or different ways of interacting with it. And so part of Alder's journey and growth is learning about these different forms of magic and kind of incorporating them into his own uh, understanding of the world, right? So yeah, that's the book. That's, and I, on that issue of um, the magic as it appears in the novel and the, the magic system, um, I'd love if we could talk about that for just a bit. Um, I was delighted by, um, there's such a great tactile quality to the writing and the prose in the sections that deal with magic. And um, boy, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, Jeremy. You can put like your own earmuffs, so your hands over your ears <laughs> if you want to, but I, I couldn't help it. I just, I wanted to bring in an example um, sentence. This appears fairly early on in the novel, but um, just to convey to folks um, just a wonderful kind of tactile sense of um, Jeremy's prose, but specifically as the magic is described and interacts uh, and the characters interact with the magic as it's presented in the novel. So this is one of my favorite sentences from the novel. Um, it's fairly early on in the book. And the sentence says, um, his magic felt more abstract 
but weightier as the walls of stone had fallen from the sky to him in the pattern of the world. So I think what you get, and Jeremy's novel is filled with these wonderful sentences like that, where um, they're carefully kind of constructed, but they convey so much. And I would say in a very elegant way about the world and a very complex to me um, situation with the magic and the way that um, individual characters interact with the magic um, in the world. And so I, this, I was going to ask Jeremy, one of the questions I prepared is um, if you think of uh, fantasists and the very different um, sort of magic systems and types of magic that appear in fantasy novels um, as being sort of on a spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question about magic systems and spectrums for Jeremy, and this is kind of inspired by um, a horrible failing of my own. Um, I'm a fiction writer and a poet as well, and and um, through, I don't know, dumb luck, uh, I won a contest that Margaret Atwood was judging at one point, and it was for poetry, but she got really excited when she found out I was a fiction writer, and she asked me to describe my magic system, which I, in my novel that I was writing, and I, I flummoxed it, and I was horrible at it, and I just, at every step of the way reading this book, I was like, Jeremy's magic is wonderful, this novel, and so much better thought out than anything I've ever constructed and anything that I've written. So my question for Jeremy is for our for the audience who have, may have read fantasy novels uh, in the past and are familiar with works of other folks, if we think of a spectrum, if uh, you'll bear with me, where like one end is sort of airtight, I would almost, and this is not a criticism, but almost mechanistic approach to magic systems on like maybe the uh, Brandon Sanderson end of the spectrum. And then at the other end, we have something that's very evocative, but is um, sort of, I guess, mist covered is a way to think about it, like a, mm -hmm. in a Tolkien, or um, even as much as I love um, Kazuo Ishiguro's The Buried Giant, that would be another example too, where there's a lot of magic, but it's not necessarily um, presented in, in a way that is, uh, I guess, the readers are able to um, understand and, and, to, and work out and sort of um, design, I guess, or craft it as a way to think about that. So my question for Jeremy is if we imagine the spectrum, maybe Sanderson on one end, Tolkien on the other, um, both with their strengths in either direction, like where does the, where does the hand of the Sun King fall, um, kind of, would you say, on that spectrum? And maybe if you could say a bit about um, about your choices with developing the magic and thinking about the magic and, sure. and planning it out for the book. So, so it, it's I, it's a little bit more towards the mechanistic side, although it's not as mechanistic as a Brandon Sanderson novel. Um, again, not to say that that's bad. I love his stuff, but uh, I would say that the way the magic works in the Hand of the Sun King is there is magic in the world and it is sort of an ineffable force that is very difficult to understand, but it conveys a lot of power. And so different, there have been different things done throughout history to control it or to create means of using it to do things, right? So the name of the series is Pact and Pattern. Uh, and that is a clue about kind of how the magic system works. Um, the different cultures have different uh, shall we say, uh, arrangements with the <laughs> ma larger magical forces in the world, which allow them to do specific things. And so insofar as the reader understands what those specific things they can do are, uh, it's pretty mechanistic. Like, you know, it's not a huge spoiler to say that you know fairly early on that certain characters can like conjure fire. So, you know, if they're in a situation where being able to conjure fire is going to be useful. Uh, that's something that they can do. And it's going to have real world consequences in terms of generating heat and smoke and stuff like that. Um, but on the other hand, very early on in the book, some things happen that kind of defy the logic and the rules of the, of the magic system that get established, which is a clue that I'm giving the reader that like, yeah, there are rules, but those rules were constructed by people in the world. They're not like inherent to the magic system. They, they aren't, uh, going, they don't constrain what's possible. They only constrain what people know how to do. Um, and as far as like why I decided to do it that way, I think that that's how a lot of things in the real world are. I think that um, we know, you know, in the modern world, we know a great deal about the laws of physics and we can use the laws of physics to do various things uh, very effectively and consistently, right? But there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. And there are things like dark matter or like quantum mechanics that kind of defy some of what we take to be the case about the laws of physics. Uh, 
And what that indicates is that there's incompleteness in our understanding and that the rules that we use to you know, do these impressive feats of engineering and chemistry or whatever are effective rules, but they're a constructed set of rules that we're using that are effective. They're not inherent necessarily to the world and there might be a better way of understanding the world and a better way of interacting with it um, that has yet to be discovered, right? I think that's a, a, that's really wonderful and does such a good job to convey um, one thing that I really enjoyed about the magic in your in your book. And you mentioned um, just before that um, history and um, Guy Gabriel Kay uh, as another author uh, who also interacts with um, whose work is is uh, fantastic but resonates with history in very thoughtful ways. It also occurred to me as you're discussing magic though that the magic in your novel or if we we're talking about physics in our, our sort of mundane real world setting, um, those theories and those rules are constructed at a certain time in a certain place by certain individuals and then mm -hmm. are necessarily fallible. And that's something we know from the study of science or the study of history, that there are these competing viewpoints um, in, say, a, an American history of, of the American Civil War. Um, what I love about your book and some of my favorite fantasists, um, their work is quite different from yours, but has this property. So whether it's a Robin Hobb or, um, you know, or uh, we mentioned Tolkien, I mean, Tolkien's kind of the same way, um, that uh, conveys it's in some fashion in their work that there are events, these amazing, very powerful, important events that occurred, but that within the, the frame, the context of the novel, those events are discussed and relayed and explained by individuals and individual characters and whose understanding like our own in the real world is um, sometimes clouded by history, by culture, by judgment. Um, so yeah. I, I just I, I love that about your novel. Um, would you mind kind of in the spirit of just sharing some more about your world building? Um, I asked you already to speak a bit about the magic. Um, could you say a little bit more about um, some of the cultures in the world? Um, not just maybe the ones that, you know, when Alder is connected to, but, um, you know, I, I have my own th favorites, I guess, or ones that I'm fascinated <laughs> with. But if you would mind, like, uh, maybe describing a bit about when Alder's culture and some of the some of the cultures that folks would get to read about um, if they pick up your book and, and as I would encourage them to do. Sure. Um, well, so the two that that Alder interacts with the most are the Nyeni and the Sienese cultures. And I'll start with the Sienese because they're, I think, the most analogous to anything in the real world. They're uh, culturally, I, I drew a lot from the Ming and Qing dynasty uh, of China and specifically the intellectual culture and the culture of imperial examination and bureaucracy that um, was, started earlier than that, but sort of came into its uh, most, shall we say, uh, powerful form or its most sophisticated version of itself during the Ming Dynasty and then continued into the Qing Dynasty. Um, and so one of the things Alder has to do early on is study the classics and poetry and writing and calligraphy and all of these different things that are going to be tested on the imperial examinations which will then decide sort of what kinds of jobs he can have. Um, and the highest placing people on those examinations are the only ones who get to learn magic in the empire. Um, which like, you don't need your wizard to know how to use or, or how, how to analyze poetry, right? But <laughs> the in the empire, as in the Ming and Qing dynasties, it's very important for uh, the this, this sort of, uh, people who wield power to have similar ideologies or to at least have the ability to con be conversant in ideologies that are important to the government, right? So if you're going to give somebody the ability to shoot laser beams out of their hands, uh, <laughs> you want them to shoot laser beams at the people you want to be sh have laser beams shot at them, right? So the, the imperial examinations in the same way that like in the Ming and Qing dynasties, generals were given the ability to lead armies because of their success at writing essays, Alder and other people can be given the ability to wield magic because of their success at writing essays. Because I think that's a really interesting way of uh, thinking about like how power is given in a society. You give power to the people whose ideas align with yours if you're a leader, if you're like a, a, an emperor or whatever. You're not going to give it to just anybody. You're going to make sure that like these are the people who will do what I want as best you can. Um, so, but they also have a lot of uh, visual culture that's very 
inspired by uh, China. Um, lots of calligraphy, landscape paintings. You can see stuff behind me that like I've collected it in traveling around that uh, should give you kind of an idea of some of the stuff you'll read about when you read about CN. Uh, the Nyeni culture is a little different. So that one I invented a little bit more from whole cloth, but it was mostly because I wanted to create something that was in very direct opposition to, to the values of the CNEs culture. So whereas CNEs culture is very hierarchical, very top down, um, Nyeni culture is very diffuse. So they, the way that the Nyeni work is, they had for a long time, like kind of the closest thing would be like the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the specific dynasty I was working on or, or working from, but there's a specific Japanese dynasty situation where there were lots of very powerful warlords who were in conflict with one another um, and the emperor was sort of weak, right? And that's sort of how the Nyeni were before the empire conquered them in the novel. There were lots of powerful warlords who were in conflict with each other or were kind of competing with each other. Um, but then also they have a, a strong tradition of hospitality, um, whereas the CNEs are a little bit more reserved. The Nyeni, like every village has a common house that any traveler can come stay in. Um, they actually like music is actually very important to them, although you don't get to see a ton of that in this book. It's, there's a bit more of it in the sequel, which I'm working on now. Um, but they're also because they're a, a sort of um, they had they, they were a warrior culture, and now they're even more so because the Nyeni who are still trying to preserve their own culture after being conquered are all fighting a rebellion against the empire. So strength is more important than the ability to write an essay. Um, you know, it, so when when uh, Alder, for, again, this isn't really a spoiler, it starts in the first chapter, but Alder's grandmother starts teaching him Nyeni values and Nyeni culture uh, sort of secretly. And it involves a lot of like sparring with weapons and learning how to uh, think tactically and stuff like that. Um, but then there are other cultures. So later on in the, in the book, you get introduced to the Anzabadi, who I tried to actually base on uh, mess like ancient Sumerian ish culture. So they're, uh, they have powerful kind of merchant leaders in their cities. The ability to control trade is very important. Um, they also, but they, but they're also an oppressed people. And it's kind of in my mind parallel to some of these cities that existed in, in Mesopotamia that would get conquered and reconquered over and over again by like the Babylonians and then the Persians and then the Greeks and stuff. But the culture at, in the city kind of stayed the same because the city itself was, was a, had been there long enough that it wasn't just gonna like change because some new dude showed up and took it over. Um, and so that, I don't, yeah, I don't wanna talk too much about them because kind of discovering what their culture is like is kind of important to the story. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like a different thing for Alder to experience this like very wildly distinct culture from his own and from the Sienese culture. Um, and, and like another thing is this, another thing the Sienese borrow from the Ming and Qing dynasty is very strict gender roles, which neither the Nyeni or the Anzabadi have. And so that's another thing that kind of challenges some of Alder's perceptions of the things he's been taught. Um, and then the other culture that features in the book that you don't get, to, or there's two other cultures that feature in the book, but you don't get quite as much of them. Um, one is the Gerzen, who are kind of a steppe people that live to the north of Cien, and they're, they're basically based on the Manchus, um, although they're slightly less militant. I kind of was thinking, like, what would the Manchus have been like if they didn't, if they had a lot less pressure on them from the Mongolians and from other steppe tribes? And it's, you know, a little bit more pastoral, but still able to, to defend themselves and stuff. But they have been conquered by the empire for a very long time. So their, their culture has sort of been absorbed um, or, or eradicated in some ways. And then the other one is the Toa Alani, who I sort of based on uh, the uh, uh, old, like, the Buddhist kingdoms in Southeast Asia that sort of predated the modern world. Like the, in the, there are a lot of them in, in places like Thailand and Myanmar. Um, but I kind of uh, combined them in a, in a way in that like 
there's a there's similar ideas between them because they have a lot of the same Buddhist roots. And those were the things I was most interested in putting in these characters. So they're more pacifistic. Um, they're not totally non-militant, but the way that they tried to resist the empire for a long time was by keeping secrets and obfuscating things that gave them an advantage rather than direct conflict. Um, and it didn't work out super well for them. Uh, and Alder's teacher is actually, his tutor when he's a young man is actually from Toa Alon and has a very specific way of thinking about how you should deal with the empire, which is based on his own culture of, of being a little bit more pacifist, being a little bit less direct in your resistance. So, yeah. I think that's great. That's real. That's, that was really wonderful. And I, I think you did an excellent job of kind of um, conveying some of the complexity there that I hope people who haven't had a chance to read the book are able to kind of glean just from getting to hear um, to hear you speak a bit about that. Um, and I just wanted to say, I guess, as a way of praise, deep praise and, and serious praise for the novel, but also as um, something maybe we could discuss a bit more, um, that whether it's um, empire or family or um, friendships. I mean, I was actually one of my favorite relationships in the novel is uh, without uh, divulging anything that would spoil it for folks, there's a really important um, male friendship early on in the in the novel. And I think uh, one thing I'm struck with um, in, Jer in Jeremy's JT's novel here, um, and that I think is actually not entirely um, the norm or not entirely common, although certainly the, the fantasists whose work I most admire um, will do a version of this. Uh, there are these large, huge forces in the book, whether that's empire or magic or these things that dwarf the individual characters, um, but they are very rarely presented to me in a, um, a binary, you know, like the, there is a, a wholly evil group or a wholly evil um, entity or something. And I, I just, uh, I was struck by how complex the relationships are between the characters. Um, I love, uh, for example, the grandmother that you mentioned early on. So very early on, we get um, this wonderful, just powerful and, and really intriguing uh, grandmother character very early on in the novel. Um, and then, as I said, the male friendship. And so I, I just was wondering if Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind speaking a bit about your inspiration for some of those complex um, human relationships, you know, family relationships and friendships in the novel, and maybe share um, either recommendations of other fantasists that you know, that whose work you enjoy, where you, they also ha include complex and um, you know, sort of uh, a broad range of different human relationships, or if, if you, in your own work, if you could let us know, were you trying to um, maybe uh, create something important that you feel that you aren't seeing enough of maybe in the field? Yeah, um, so as far as the inspiration goes, I, I think that good stories are about people who are in conflict. And I think that there's three really you can boil most conflict down to one of three types. There's in like internal conflict, right? You have something where you feel conflicted internally about what you're doing or about uh, your place in the world and you want to change it. Or you, you might not even be totally aware of the internal conflict, but something feels wrong and it has to resolve, uh, which there's a lot of in this book. The second is like violent external conflict, where, which I think is really the most common form of conflict in fantasy and science fiction today, which is where there are opposing forces that are willing to destroy each other um, for the sake of whatever the focus of their opposition is, right? Um, and so those, those stories can be really good, and there's some of that in this book, but I'm actually the most interested in the third type of conflict, which is interpersonal nonviolent conflict, where you have two people who are at odds for some reason, and they can't just hit each other with swords to decide who should be who who wins right like either because they care about each other and so they don't want to hurt the other person but there's still a conflict there there's still a problem or because uh the conflict is too com is more complex than like hitting somebody with swords could really solve and every conflict in, in the book, I try to make that kind of conflict that when it's between two people where there is a way to solve this, which isn't violence. Violence is always a failure state of attempts to solve the problem. Um, and so like, the, you know, you, you talk about the, 
family relationships. I think that early on, what I was trying to do is create a dynamic set of family, like, like a web almost of family relationships in, in Alder's household, where everybody is kind of at odds with each other for different reasons. Nobody's like 100% on the same page with anybody else. Because I think that that's just how a lot of families are. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it's often the case that like you all love each other, but you're all kind of in disagreement about things. And then resolving those conflicts is messy and complicated. And that shapes a lot of Alder's personality is like growing up in a, in a household where there are different people with different agendas and they are pulling him in different directions. Uh, but then as the novel goes on, I wanted to give, like, I wanted to create scenarios for the main character where he has to, to like, use what is not his primary skill set. So his primary skill set is that he's very, very smart, right? He's a super intelligent person, but he's actually kind of a social moron. Like, he just doesn't <laughs> really get other people very well. Part of that comes from being raised in an isolated garden by a tutor and having literally zero friends his own age for most of his life. Um, and so I wanted to create situations where, like, the solution here is just to have some empathy for another person or, like, to listen to what they're saying and like understand why they're saying it and maybe like negotiate a little bit. But then Alder's not very good at that. So he has to learn and grow in order to solve those problems. And sometimes he does successfully and sometimes he doesn't. Um, and I think that like that can manifest in the form of positive relationships, right? Like you talk about the, there's this friendship he makes early on, which starts out really rocky, but the, in the, in the course of solving the problem, it becomes like a really strong friendship. Um, and uh, there are other relationships in the book that are like that, that start out like we're actually, we're kind of on opposing sides of an issue, but then we actually kind of talk about it and resolve it. And that leads to us understanding each other better than we might have if we'd been on the same side from the beginning. Um, and I, 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 so other authors who I think do a really good job of this kind of conflict would be uh, China Miaville does this a lot where he has characters who disagree about something and, and need to talk about it to solve it. They can't just kill each other. Uh, Fonda Lee wrote her Jade, uh, Jade City and then Jade War and Jade Legacy. I haven't read the second or third books in the series yet, but Jade City has some really interesting interpersonal conflict between these sibling characters who are sort of the main characters of the novel and they can't just punch each other right they have to try to work together and so there's some of that like negotiating solutions to problems that's going on that I think is really compelling um, a book that I just read which I loved but I didn't just read it's been like two months now but I keep talking about it is uh, The Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez which uh, is a science fiction novel which mo like almost all of the conflict in the book is this kind of conflict. There's some kind of big external forces that are putting pressure on the main characters, but a lot of the like conflict going from chapter to chapter is characters that are part like part members of a crew of a starship having problems with each other and needing to solve those problems. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't work out, but it feels very human and very realistic. Um, and I, I do think like, there's a growing trend in science fiction and fantasy to get away from the like, there's a dark Lord and we need to go kill him as the main source of conflict and towards a more complex uh, way of constructing those large scale conflicts. Like if, in my book, right, there are really powerful forces, but the problem that's underlying the world that's like the big fantasy you know, magical problem that's going on is a result of a bad negotiation a long time ago. It's not somebody who wants to destroy the world. It's that there was a, a peace that was reached, but the conditions of that peace left room for somebody to manipulate them and do something to kind of get an advantage that the other side doesn't like. And so it's, it's not like one group wants to destroy the world and the other doesn't. It's like both groups have their own things they want, and because of some tricky wordplay, essentially, uh, one side has an advantage over the other now, and that's unstable. Um, and I think that, like, I'm I'm interested in seeing more stuff like that. I'm, I'm interested in seeing fewer dark lords and more, like, you know, real the kinds of conflicts that exist in the real world. If you think back to the Cold War, um, the, a lot of the 
history that's been done about the Cold War has shown that actually there were very few situations where either the United States or the, or the Soviet Union actually wanted any conflict. A lot of the time they were both just trying to do their own thing, but they thought they had to do something aggressive because they were afraid that the other side might do something aggressive and they needed to like preempt that. And so a lot of the biggest, most tense moments of the Cold War come from misunderstandings or from like one side trying to preempt the other. Um, and so that's the kind of large scale conflict that I think is, is uh, I think there's room for more stuff like that in fantasy. Yeah, I think I would absolutely agree with you um, both about the trend and that and that they're uh, toward sort of away from dark lords and, and fantasy and um, especially secondary world fantasy um, novels in general, which is wonderful, but also just the need for, um, yeah, just the need for that, that kind of change. And I think in your um, in your book too, I think that helps. Uh, this is just one person's opinion as a reader, and hopefully other folks will chime in when we we get to the Q and A in just a short bit here. Um, who have read the book as well, but I found that for as one of your readers, um, focusing on that sort of type of conflict at the, the big, huge stakes, you know, for the world and for the groups involved in the world in your novel, um, also helped for uh, the setting which is, I think, a huge challenge for fantasists, um, especially secondary world fantasy authors. Um, you know, you are teaching us how everything works as we are also becoming invested, you know, yeah. in the world that's there. And it really helped me um, respond to the world and, and the world and the magic. It helped it helped uh, those things resonate with me as a reader because everything felt so um, lived in, you know, that there was a, there was an ancient past, a sort of history that was long ago, but they're incredibly high stakes and things are complicated you know as you said it was sort of an un, a um yeah the the arrangement was uh i don't want to give anything away but the arrangement <laughs> created huge huge issues right that resonate and gener multi-generationally so i think mm -hmm. um you know jeremy and i in our in our friendship we've talked about um living in china we've both lived and worked in china in the past and that's something i quite appreciate about um chinese literature my, my wife studied um chinese women's literature in graduate school for a really long time and um, is this uh, the sense of huge forces stretching across generations. And that's something that in your novel, I, I quite like as well. And that mm -hmm. I do think is, um, it, it's there, it's there in the history of secondary world fantasy literature, but um, I don't think it's always done well at the risk of embarrassing Jeremy. I think he <laughs> does it quite well. And so, and so I, I really hope people read this book. It's something special. Um, you know, I, I I mean that. I really think it's special. And and uh, you know, I've I've been joking around in social media with Jeremy in the last few days a bit, just about um, you know, how do we put Jeremy in a room and, and force him to produce these books more quickly? <laughs> uh, totally joking, of course, right? You know, you know yeah. all of these, yeah, it's impossible, and you have no control over the publishing uh, process. You know, really, or little, or a little, maybe little control over when Barely. these things would come out, right? Yeah. But. Um, I, I hope that I'm conveyed that, uh, you know, it's really whetted my appetite for more about these characters, which speaks to Jeremy's skill in the novel. Um, a few characters uh, without giving much away about them at all. Like I love Hissing Cat. I love like Dr. <laughs> Show. Like some of these characters who are not even, um, you know, maybe are not like Wen, who of course we get a lot of Wen. This is a um, first person uh, narrative and we get that strong, um, well-developed voice of when looking backward at these events and i think you do a good job of being very controlled with that first person voice looking backward too you know there will be an occasional comment and as a reader i want to catch all of those little like moments for when is sort of commenting like oh if only i'd done something it's just a, always a sentence or a little <laughs> snippet and it just makes me pay attention and kind of sit up straighter in my chair like wait what yeah. did when say what what's happening and yeah. um but yeah those are uh those are reader pokers those are like, hey, did you catch that? Like, are you paying attention right now? Because this is really important. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, I felt sufficiently uh, poked at those moments, at those moments yeah. right? Um, well, and I mentioned the uh, q and I can see we've got a few questions there in the chat. Um, my, I do have one final question for Jeremy. I know that you've been, um, you've been doing a lot of, um, of speaking with folks and just different interviews, and um, which is, is a, an exciting process for every writer I know. When a book comes out, it can be a little bit exhausting, but um, one thing I wanted to make sure and ask you too, 
is, um, is there something that you've kind of been hoping folks would ask about with the novel that hasn't, hasn't been touched on yet? You know, not that this process is over for you, <laughs> you know, it's just going to keep yeah. going, but, you know, but um, is there something that you, you wish folks had asked so far that, that maybe you could share with us before we turn things over to the Q&A? Not really. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm also just, I, I, this is the third time that I've kind of gotten in front of people and talked about it in the last week. So I, I think I've just been talking about it a lot. So I'm not entirely sure what we haven't said. But one thing that I never get tired of talking about, which we did get to talk about in this, was the magic system. Um, I have more I could say about it, but I think people should read the book before I say some of those things. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I think you asked some good questions. You know, I nobody had asked me before about the different cultures and about the conflict, which I think are both things that I uh, put, put a lot of effort into and I hadn't had a chance to talk about those yet. So I appreciate that. Oh, great. Well, my, my great pleasure to talk to you um, about the book so far. And uh, maybe I know we've got several questions in the chat. And Claire, would you mind if I just turn things over to you to start the Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Uh, so this first question is from Andrea uh, and she is wondering, was there anything you had to edit out of the book that you wish you could have kept? Um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> there always is, uh, any, every story I've ever had published or, you know, th with this book and now with the second one where I'm working on incorporating some revision notes from my agent, there's always stuff that you put in that you're like, uh, this is really cool and fun and I like this and then you have to get rid of it. Um, so in this book, there was a whole, like the, toward the end of the book, there's a bit of a travel sequence. I don't want to say like what's going on in it because it's a spoiler, but there were like two or three more little vignettes in that travel sequence that were some really fun little moments between a couple of characters. And it's one of my favorite pairs of characters to write in the book. And so I kind of got a little self-indulgent there where it was like just me having fun writing goofy conversations, right? Um, and when and they made it through my agent, it's like my agent let me keep them, which was rare. He made me cut a lot of stuff. But then my editor, uh, he didn't make me cut a lot in the final revision process, but he did say like, I don't think you need these, these two little conversations here. I think we get the point of like what this relationship is like. And he told me it was up to me. Like, if you really wanna keep these, you can, but I don't think they're adding to the book. And I think that this section is kind of slow with them in it and cutting them out. It was like 10,000 words, right? It was a lot. Um, and he was like, cutting these out would, I think, speed up the pacing here. And he was right, right? Because at that point in the book, there was like this moment of high tension. And then we were like, kind of, you know, slightly slower part before we ramped up to the finale. And that slower part was just too long, where all of the tension that had been built up to the first peak had kind of dissipated. Um, and so I cut them, but I still have them on my hard drive. And if I ever do like, a, if I ever get famous enough that I can convince somebody to publish a like, right, like a, you know, George R. R. Martin has his uh, fire and blood thing or like his world of ice and fire books that just have like random things that are world building or elements that he wanted to in include, but didn't in the books, I would definitely throw those out there. Like, did you like that dynamic? Here's two more scenes of it, just in case, you know, or maybe if I start a Patreon or something. I could put those up there. <laughs> okay. Uh, this question is from Charlie. He says, I enjoy the way pursuing magic brings out the best and the worst in your characters. I notice a lot of characters expecting magic to reflect their ideas of who's right and who's wrong, and they never quite get away with it. Is that just a piece of the moral nuance of the book, or is there an argument about the morality of knowing of knowledge you wanted to work through in this series? Yes, to both of those questions. Um, or uh, Well, you present that like it's a either or, but I think it's both. Um, it is a piece of the moral nuance in the book, right? Um, and also, hi, Charlie. <laughs> we usually play D&D &D on Saturday nights, but you're here instead. Um, but the, uh, yeah, it's totally, I added that for moral nuance. I, I wanted Alder to be, um, in a position where he has a set of beliefs and they are constantly challenged. Um, and 
it is definitely there for the benefit of the story but I think over the course of the whole series I am trying to set something up and we'll see how well I pay it off which is about how the way that we construct knowledge is has moral implications right um the way that we define reality like the way the way that we like decide which propositions are true or false or which propositions are even knowable or which propositions have truth value at all carries with it moral weight um, and that can be in the form of uh, essentially like alienating certain people because the things that they think or the way that they think doesn't fit with our system of assigning truth value right so like somebody could believe something that's impossible for, for science to verify right it's like non-verifiable belief but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's false that just means that it's not scientifically verifiable um similarly you could have you know things that are uh you know so okay so if, as an example one of the things that i studied in college was uh ancient chinese medicine or traditional chinese medicine and traditional chinese medicine is actually very effective um, in certain ways, certain elements of it, I should say, are very effective. And the uh, problem with it really is, is that it uses a different set of, um, like a different vocabulary, but also a different set of assumptions about nature itself and about the body. Um, and so when you try to evaluate like the efficacy of an herb that's very commonly used in Chinese medicine and is said to have certain uh, uh, efficacy within that, um, and you try to evaluate it with Western medicine, you run into a lot of problems because what they're saying the herb does when they describe it and describe what its function is in Chinese medicine does not actually translate into anything you can measure in the body, right? So they might say like, oh, this, this herb like can, um, uh, elevate the young and uh, it can, you know, help chi flow, right? Well, neither of those things exist in the body in the Western medicine's perception of the body, right? But they do in Chinese medicine's perception of the body and they do have some effects. So like there's this weird dynamic where there are certain traditional Chinese medical treatments like massage, which have been totally welcomed by Western medicine in a lot of ways because they're just demonstrably effective and we can create a vocabulary for them using Western medicine that makes sense, right? Like we talk about tight muscles and stuff like that or like a, a cervic acid or whatever the one that gets in your muscles is that massage can help relieve. Um, but there are others that are also very, like have an effect, right? They're eff efficacious herbs, but the what they do doesn't translate as well into Western medicine. And so despite the fact that studies have shown that they do something, right? They can't, like, there's no way to meaningfully translate them into the Western tradition. Um, and that can, have imp that can have a significant impact on people because there might be a treatment that would be effective for you in one medical tradition or the other, but because you live under one and not the other, you never get access to that treatment. And in, in kind of the reverse case, in the Ming and Qing dynasties, nobody did surgery really. They did some um, and they did, there were certain, like they would lance boils and they, they would do certain things, but surgery was not as big of a thing uh, because of certain beliefs about the body and about the sanctity of the body and that surgery was morally harmful in certain ways. And so like if you had appendicitis, that would probably kill you because there wasn't really anything that they could do about that acute disease. So if you happen to live in that, under that medical system and you didn't have access to surgery, you're kind of out of luck, right? Um, but I think that like, this is a, a, an ongoing thing. It's, it crosses different disciplines where what we, it's not, it's not so much about what we think is true. It's so much about, it's more about what we, uh, or what tools or what, what, what we do in order to decide truth or to decide what it could possibly even be true. And then the ways that we like alienate certain things and invite other things in can, you know, make some people more powerful, other people weaker. It can elevate certain ways of thinking about the world and diminish others. And that can all have, you know, that can all have impact. Good question. <laughs> uh, 
let's see. Um, this one is from Hans. Uh, in the course of all their studies, we get to hear some quotes from the text he's studying. Is it part of your writing process to flesh out the greater context of that literature? I do some of that. Um, so I, there, for example, there's a, the Traveler on the Narrow Way is a writer who gets cited all the time. And I have actually written three or four pages of just random aphorisms from Traveler on the Narrow Way. Um, and the reason I did that was because I wanted to have, like, again, it's, it's, uh, Sienese culture is very inspired by Ming and Qing dynasty uh, versions of Confucianism and Taoism. And I, but I didn't want it to be exactly the same. So I didn't want like the metaphors that they used or the ways that they talked about it to be exactly the same as the way that they would talk about it in the actual Ming or Qing dynasty or in like a Chinese novel from that era. I wanted it to feel like a secondary world. And so what I did is I wrote out like a bunch of aphorisms that used a bunch of different like vocabulary and stuff to create, to give myself kind of like a, uh, a sort of like an aesthetic guide. Like these are the, diff this, this is the way that this culture talks, right? Um, I don't have it all written. Like in the, in the book, this is like volumes and volumes and volumes of stuff that they have to study for the Imperial examinations. But I have like maybe three or four pages, but I have enough for me to like, I'm like, oh, I need a quote from Traveler on the Narrow Way and it needs to be about this. I can really quickly construct one that's kind of like in the voice of that character in the book who's just a dude who wrote a bunch of things thousands of years ago. Um, so like, yes and no, I, to a certain extent I have fleshed it out more, but um, I haven't, not nearly as much as it seems, but I think that that's, or hopefully not nearly as much as it seems, but I think that that's part of like the fun of, of writing fantasy is you uh, get to kind of do a little magic trick every once in a while where you make it seem like there's a whole lot going on here and there's a lot of depth and actually it's like, you know, just a little bit, just enough for me to convince you. Okay, this one is from Kale. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you went about choosing the names for your characters? You've got some names that seem translated like Oriole and some that don't like Koroha. And I'm super interested in how you made those choices. Right, okay, so the names that are translated are either Nayeni or Sienese because those are Alder's native languages. Those are the two languages that he speaks fluently. And so he, in, in those cultures, the names are literal names like literal references to, to objects or the world. Um, and so like, for example, Alder's grandma's name is bit Broken Limb. Um, and so that's what it's, whenever it shows up in the text, that's what it shows up as. Uh, other like Toa Alani names and Gerzen names uh, are untranslated because Alder doesn't speak those languages. Um, he does speak a little bit of Anzabadi, but he's not fluent. And so the Anzabadi names are also untranslated, even though he can communicate in that language. It's not like when he hears the word, he's hearing it as the word, he's hearing it as just like their name. He might not even know, like that, for example, uh, Katiz is one of the Anzabadi characters. He might not even know what that means. It's just a name to him because he doesn't really, he, his vocabulary in that language is much more limited. Um, but yeah, so I, the reason I did that is I wanted certain cultures to feel more distant from Alder than others. I wanted him to feel like he was simultaneously Nayani and Sienese to the point where like, when he hears a name in those languages, he hears it literally. Um, and like, this is, so this is a thing in like Japanese and Chinese and other Asian languages where the names have direct literal translations. They don't necessarily hit the ear that way like when you hear the name you're not necessarily thinking like oh that name means this but the name is a pair of words that have literal meaning in english we have some names like that like you might be named river or something and it still hits your ear as a name but it also is a word that means river but then like my name jeremy is a hebrew name that we use in english because it's a biblical reference and it doesn't really like it does have a meaning but it doesn't really mean anything when you say jeremy beyond it being a name and so like that was kind of the what i was playing with was uh the names in the cultures that are uh familiar to alder are the names that he hears the the names as words 
and the cultures that are less familiar to him, he just hears them as names. Uh, but then there are other, like another thing that people may or may, may or may not pick up on is the last names in Sienese are also just names. They're untranslated. And the reason for that is because they're thousands of years old and they're no longer meaningful words. They are just sounds that refer to different families. Um, and that's actually also a thing in, in some cultures where like there are certain names that have been around for so long, they don't actually really refer to anything anymore. They're just name sounds, but um, yeah. Also a good question. <laughs> Oops. So I think uh, I will close us out with my own question. Um, so you, I'm interested in hearing you talk about uh, the magic trick when you're talking about the, the text that Alder is studying. And I mm -hmm. guess it, this is a huge question, but I'm, um, what do you like about writing science fiction? Like what about writing science fiction is fun for you in a way that writing in a, in a different genre or more, or like with more realism? Mm -hmm. um that's there's sort of two answers there's the answer to like so I, I guess i can read the question two ways one is like why do you write science fiction and fantasy as opposed to other things and the answer to that is very simple it's i've tried writing other things and i'm bad at it um i'm just not as good at writing realistic fiction i've tried it a few times and it um never quite works out it's always a little bit uh it always feels a little stilted. It always feels a little obvious. Um, it's not, I'm just, I just, I don't know. I just can't come up with it as interesting ideas for it, I guess. Uh, and I think that part of the reason for that is because growing up, I've read so much fantasy and science fiction that that's just sort of how my imagination works is that's kind of where I just naturally am inclined to go in my uh, creativity. Um, but then what do I like so much about writing it? I, the thing that, that, I think is the most appealing to me about writing genre and writing speculative fiction, fantasy, science fiction, whatever, is the fact that you can, um, you, are, you are not restricted to the real world in terms of the objects you can put into the book that then have weight and narrative power. So if you're writing realistic fiction, that's like strictly realistic. You can put in zany stuff, like you can have a weird dream sequence or whatever, and that can have psychological impact on a character, but it's not the same as if that weird zany thing is literally real to the character and might kill them or, or has like a, a threat to it. And I think what this allows you to do, and I, and I would again point to China Mieville as somebody who I think gets a lot of benefit from this in his writing, what it allows you to do is create non-obvious but strong metaphors in your literature. So you can make a monster or something and it, there's a way of doing it really lazily where it's like, oh yeah, that monster is obviously like representative of this social problem or whatever. But you can do it in such a way where the monster and, and the struggle against the monster to overcome it becomes metaphorical for something in society in a way that's not direct and it does not draw people's attention to that social concept. But you can have the same moral conversation, right? About like what, how do we together resist this kind of threat or how do we together overcome this kind of problem? Um, and what I think is, is powerful about that at least in my experience and in my thinking, is if you if you write a story where where you want to deal with a problem and you put that problem front and center, you immediately create a situation where some people will relate very strongly to that problem and and they'll be on board. Some people will feel attacked because they identify with the problem, where they think they you're now talking about me. I'm the problem, right? Or they won't care because either they don't think it's a real problem or they don't want to read something political, right? And so they'll disengage and they'll put the book down. So you basically lose two thirds of your audience if you do that. In fantasy and science fiction and horror, actually I think horror is the best at this when it's done really well. You can have that same conversation. 
about whatever your concern is or whatever your so socio-political interest is without immediately alienating two thirds of your audience where it's still possible for somebody who fundamentally disagrees with you to be on board for a story about dragons. And then they, you might be able to kind of slip something under the door almost, or like slip something past their defenses in terms of like, here's a way of thinking about this kind of conflict or about this kind of problem that you haven't considered before. And now in the novel, it's being considered. In, in, in reading the novel, you're being asked to consider it. And it, they might not change their mind. They might not really take they might not even notice it's happening, but there's a chance that they will. You, and you're at least getting them to engage, right? Whereas if, if, if you present it to them too forcefully, they won't. Um, so when I'm right, like there are a lot of really weird philosophical ideas in my in everything I've written because I think about stuff a lot and I have a lot of opinions about things. And, but I think if I wrote, a novel set in the real world where characters were like talking about the philosophy of science and like uh, arguing about um, truth value propositions and how do you like evaluate them and like what gets to be true and like what are the different concerns at play there and like how does the creation of a truth value system inherently do political violence to certain groups and stuff like that. Um, and is that is that still worthwhile because maybe the truth value proposition is powerful enough that it's sufficiently helpful to everybody or whatever like that's all interesting stuff to have a conversation about i think it makes for a pretty boring novel um and so i but i can explore those things and i can have like a, i can write a cool story where i get to think about that stuff and engage with it uh and also write a fun novel by writing a fantasy novel where i create a big elaborate metaphor by way of a magic system for all that stuff But also, like, wizards are cool. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to put that on the jacket of the next one, but also yeah. wizards are cool. Um, so I think we'll leave it there for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Ben and Jeremy. That was great. It was a lot of fun. Thank you all for coming. Everybody buy three copies of Jeremy's book. <laughs> <laughs> mail it to your friends. Yeah. You make aunties mail it to your friends. It's a, it's a That's good, right. Good, good present. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thanks and have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. <laughs>